and uh, which was done to punish me, by the way, said I didn't get any money from it, but uh, it, hel it helped also to alert people to the Federal Reserve. So the information is out there, it's on its way, and uh, what we have to look forward to, if you think you've seen prosperity yet, you haven't seen nothing yet, because we're going all the way, we're going to full production, and the people are going to get the benefits of their own economy. And <laughs> So I thank you, and I, I just wanted to bring you that message of cheer. And this is absolutely as true of Canada as it is in the United States. You know, the first person who brought me to Canada was Eileen Pressler, and I said to her, why is the Canadian dollar uh, below the American dollar? They should be uh, trading at par. She said, because the bankers manipulate it by keeping the Canadian dollar down, uh, they create all sorts of opportunities for speculation. And uh, uh, there's uh, great business is going on between the United States and Canada because of the disparity in the currency. And uh, everybody's making money, everybody's happy, and, uh, but uh, as I say, it's totally, from an economic point of view, it's totally insane that the, do the Canadian dollar would be below the American dollar. Well, but it's brought to buy up our country. Our country is almost gone. Well, that's exactly right. They're creating opportunities for speculators, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. But hopefully that will change too, because uh, uh, what we want is economic equity, we want fairness, we don't want government by criminals, and that's what we've got. These people are criminals. Uh, in my book, The Curse of Canaan, I trace it back 5,000 years. These people didn't start yesterday. They have per perfected these techniques over thousands of years. They have dynast family dynasties all over the world, and uh, they're simply used to having their own way, but in the modern world, they're totally obsolete, they're totally archaic, and they've got to go, and they're going to go. Thank you. Now, we do have time for a couple of questions, and I'll welcome uh, any questions, and I'll try to answer them. Uh, you know, the old, uh, the old technique was uh, that you'd be asked a question at a public meeting, and you would say, I'm so glad you answered that, I'm so glad you asked that question, and then they would proceed not to answer it. <laughs> but I've never done that. I'll answer any question, and I'll be glad to entertain questions. <laughs> All right, yes. Uh, Mullins, Eustace Mullins, M-U-L-L-I-N-S. People think it's an Irish name, but it's actually French. It's Moulin, which means Miller in French. <laughs> and, uh, Can you just squeeze the handle to adjust yeah, the height? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just squeeze it and... Yeah. <coughs> you made a compelling case for uh, what happened to Lincoln and to Kennedy. Of course, Kennedy with Executive Order 11110, June 4, 63. Do you have anything to say or any confirming information on Garfield and McKinley? Was well, the same motive behind the assassination of those two presidents? Well, the, the uh, assassinations of Garfield and McKinley were done by the bankers because they were working to get this central bank set up, you see. They were planning for it. And uh, both Garfield and McKinley totally objected to it. So they had to be gotten rid of. They were murdered simply because they were in the way of the central bank plan. And uh, almost all of these things uh, that happen, happen because the bankers want them to. See, the average American citizen or Canadian citizen is not really out to assassinate anybody. They might not like a particular politician, but they're not going to assassinate him. The assassinations have to be carefully planned. There has to be a lot of money behind it. Now, what they did with Kennedy, they, they flew in a group of uh, Sicilian killers from Marseille. They were the ones that actually carried out the assassination. But like I say, they had five teams there because this had to go forward and uh, they couldn't have any recrimination and they wanted to happen. So if 
If one team didn't do it, the other team, and so the Cecilia did it. And uh, they flew into Canada, by the way, to a safe house immediately after the assassination. They stayed here in Canada for five days. This has all been documented. And then they flew them back to Marseille. So that's how it was done. Any comment on Robert Kennedy? Uh, Robert Kennedy was a revenge killing by the mafia. And I'm sorry, you missed it. Oh, Robert Kennedy was a revenge killing by the mafia. He was no threat to them anymore because they'd killed his uh, brother. In fact, the happiest moment of Jedgar Hoover's life was when he picked up the phone and called Robert Kennedy and said, your brother has been killed, and he hung up. <laughs> and Robert Kennedy was devastated by that. He never recovered because they really hated each other. Uh, actually, Robert Kennedy hated homosexuals in the first place, and uh, he uh, simply considered that J. Edgar Hoover, as head of the FBI, was totally subordinate to the Attorney General. Well, all the previous Attorney Generals had uh, allowed J. Edgar Hoover to do whatever he wanted to because uh, they were pretty much afraid of him. Kennedy was the first person that ever um, <coughs> opposed him. And Kennedy, by the way, was murdered in the Ambassador Hotel. Now, the uh, Roney Plaza Hotel in Miami Beach was the winter headquarters of the Mafia, and that's where J. Edgar Hoover and Clyde Tolson spent their winter vacations. So, but Robert Kennedy was murdered in the Ambassador Hotel, which was also a Shine Hotel, a Mafia hotel. See, the Mafia recruited a guy named J. Meyer Shine to uh, handle their real estate interests, mostly movies and hotels. And so with the Mafia money, J. Meyer Shine built these in Matt, lavish hotels and uh, movie theaters around the United States which are all Mafia stuff. And um, so when Robert Kennedy went to the Ambassador Hotel, he had no idea he was walking into the hands of the enemy. I'm sure he had no, no idea that there was a Mafia hotel. And uh, because Robert Kennedy was a different person from myself. We worked together on the McCarthy Committee, by the way. But uh, Robert Kennedy, with all of his money and influence, he had other people do things. Well, I never had anybody do anything. If I wanted to do anything, I had to go and research it myself. The result was all of my information was firsthand. Everything Robert Kennedy got was filtered to him. And as I say, when he went to the Ambassador Hotel, he had no idea he was walking into his own assassination. I would have known that. I would have known it was a, a, a Shine Hotel. And uh, Shine, by the way, his son David, was the Shine Cohen partnership which uh, sabotaged McCarthy's fight against the communists. McCarthy let me go in order to hire Cone and Shine. <laughs> so I have a personal uh, 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 memoir of that. Well, first, Eustace, uh, thanks so much for accepting Wes's invitation to bring your experience to Canada. Uh, what's your take on JFK's junior? Was that just a Washington airplane he was using, like a Washington heart attack? Is well, uh, JFK made a fatal mistake. First of all, he was a very dangerous person because he was the most famous celebrity in the United States. Second, he had $150 million of his own. Third, he had his own national magazine. This makes you an extremely dangerous person. And fourth, he had decided to do an all-out expose of Mossad and the Anti-Defamation League as the most dangerous influence in American politics. Well. <laughs> uh, when you go embark on a program like that, you're going to develop some engine trouble. <laughs> uh, second question. Um, you talked about Rothschild uh, basically uh, financing uh, the buying of the Jewish homeland. But my understanding is Rothschild is not actually Jewish to begin with himself at all. Is it the original dynasty isn't Jewish, is it? Well, the original dynastic name was Bauer, which means peasant in uh, German, but um, as far as I know, uh, the Rothschild family has always been Jewish as far back as I can uh, find out. Uh, even when they were Bowers, they were uh, Jews and they were in the money business. Uh, see, the Jewish people during the Middle Ages were mostly in the uh, rag, rag, what they call rag merchant business. They dealt in secondhand clothes and then uh, they went into other businesses, but they always wound up in the money business because they were the, 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 problem, the uh, advantage they had was they were international, just like the five Rothschild brothers set up uh, 
uh, in the five capitals of Europe. And by that means, we could control the whole European uh, area. Well, I guess we wouldn't mind being peasants as well, then. <laughs> no, yeah. but it's funny when you talk about, you know, we talk about Bill Gates being the richest man in the world. It's funny how when they always do those lists, there's never any bankings on the list. No, no, that's uh, forbidden. Forbes and all these people know they can't put any of those people on the lists, and uh, they never appear on the list. Yeah, uh, so I was just wondering uh, with uh, uh, the royalty of, of England, originally coming from uh, Germany, uh, why was Hitler so able to launch such an attack against uh, England and coming quite close to uh, finishing it off? Well, it's, uh, it's called international finance. You say the royal family of England owned half of the Ethel patents and all of the German planes uh, which were bombing London, uh, the royal family of England was getting royalties on the, the gasoline they were burning. So, <laughs> so it's just a matter of business. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mullins, for coming. Um, I want you to speak a little bit on vaccinations, because that's been a big issue in my life for uh, over 20 years. And number two, did you know um, Ayn Rand? And uh, you probably did. And uh, what kind of lady was she, really? Well, Ayn Rand uh, was the disciple of a new conservatism, and Alan Greenspan, who's now chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, was one of her principal pupils, and she believed in an enlightened selfishness, which in itself is fine, and, uh, but uh, she was very influential. She's sort of the patron saint of the uh, National Review, which is the organ of neoconservatism in the United States, the Bill Buckley organization, and Bill Buckley, of course, was a CIA opera operative all his life, and the National Review is a CIA paper. And its uh, gods are uh, Gene Kirkpatrick and Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand. And <laughs> so uh, none of these people have anything to offer uh, uh, in the way of truth or justice. And in fact, uh, people like myself are considered a non-person by the National Review. Bill Buckley and I started out at the same time, but with Bill Buckley's CIA backing, he got national publicity, and I got none. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the way it goes. What about vaccinations? Oh, vaccinations. I, could, I have a chapter on that in my uh, murder by injection book. And uh, vaccinations are probably the most toxic substance you can uh, introduce into the human body. Plus, they're deliberately engineered that the immune system cannot fight them, cannot expel them. And so they stay in your system uh, throughout your life. And uh, da, quote medical authorities who say that every vaccination is a time bomb in the uh, human system, which at some point, maybe 25, even 50 years, is going to erupt in a stroke, heart attack, or other or cancer. So you're carrying this, if you've been vaccinated, you carry this time bomb in your system, and you don't know when it's going to blow up and you're going to fall over with a stroke or heart attack. <laughs> Uh, the purpose there, I think, is to ensure a, a lifetime of uh, uh, poor health and uh, constant consumption of uh, drugs and uh, medications. Because uh, after all, if the Rockefellers, they control every major drug company, uh, they want to see the business coming in, you know. You want that bottom line and you want that, those growth figures for the next 10 years. So it's, it's all planned and it's uh, deliberately planned Everything that they do, and including vaccination, is uh, planned to uh, attack the immune system and make you incapable of ever seeing uh, good health again in your lifetime. Thank you for your truth. Surely. Would you comment on the Norfed dollar, if you know about it, and other money that's being printed that's backed by gold and silver in the States? Uh, yes, I'm familiar with the Norfed operation. In fact, I'm a member of it, and uh, uh, it's a way out. But uh, until we get control of our own currency, Norfed itself is a very small operation. And uh, what we simply need is to go into the Federal Reserve System and arrest everybody. I had a friend who did that, by the way. He went into the Federal Reserve Building on Constitution Avenue, the uh, Marble Palace, and uh, he was going to arrest the members of the Federal Reserve Board, 
which is the only thing to do because conspiracy to rob people is a definitely statutory offense. And that's what they do there. Uh, they rob everybody through these uh, planned, uh, I have a lot of material here on the Greenspan and the fact that his so-called fight against inflation is, total, is considered total nonsense by every economic writer in, in the world. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned uh, that the Zionists were said that uh, they believed that they, you could not have a state of Israel uh, until the, second, the, the coming of the Messiah. No, that was the Orthodox Jews. Uh, that's Orthodox Judaism. The Zionists well, came up with an alternative under Reform <laughs> Judaism that you could go ahead and have a Jewish state without the Messiah coming. So the, the Zionists believe that you can have an a, 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 a Israeli state then? Oh yes, and they did. That's how they achieved it because until they came along with this alternative plan, the Jewish community of the world would never accept uh, a uh, uh, Jewish state without the Messiah. So that must have been uh, bought and, and, and paid for by... Oh, the Rothschilds put every penny into, uh, what is it, into Palestine. They sent the settlers out there. They paid all of their... Uh, expenses, bought the land for them, uh, set up uh, uh, great operations, wineries, and uh, agricultural things. All that was Rothschild money. And all the controversy right now going on in there between the Palestinians, you know, that's, uh, that's just got to be a, a big uh, banking operation, it seems to me, connected oh, with oh, the oil. Oh, so. If you go to the state of Israel, you'll see the main street is called Rothschild uh, Boulevard. The entire Israeli parliament was donated by Jacob Rothschild of London. Uh, in other words, imagine if a private American donated the entire uh, building to, of the United States. <laughs> and that's what happened in Israel. It was all donated by the Rothschilds. Uh, Yusuf, uh, first of all, congratulations on all your outstanding work you've done through the years. Uh, I've known and heard of you for a number of years myself. I've been in the issue myself for some 20 years. but. Back in 1950, I haven't, information, I haven't been able to confirm it yet, maybe you can help me, that the Senate Intelligence Committee put out a three or four volume report which listed all the communists in America and all their affiliations. Nella Roosevelt was in there supposedly. Um, I don't know how many uh, lists of organizations she belonged to. And uh, when LBJ came into office, uh, the word I have is that he uh, ordered that all of them be destroyed. And uh, I understand there are seven or eight of them that have not been destroyed. Do you have any idea where I might be able to find one of those? I really do not because, of course, when they order those uh, books destroyed, they're pretty thorough. Now, I do know that in the Army and Department of State, now whether it's under Truman or not, I'm not sure, all, uh, all files concerning communist affiliation of government employees were destroyed. The whole Army uh, was totally cleaned out. And uh, in fact, when I knew Joe McCarthy, he still depended, uh, depended on the FBI for a lot of information. Uh, Bob Serene and, uh, was the uh, main person who was bringing him information, and they, they fired Bob Serene <laughs> later on too, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, uh, yeah, McCarthy's information came from the FBI. I'm aware of that, and uh, liaison from, I was in the FBI 27 years, by the yeah. way. Uh, and a second question I'd like to ask you is, um, I've contended, having no documentation, of course, that the downfall of the, of the wall in Berlin and the downfall of communism was all a facade in order for us to uh, weaken our defenses and cut back and uh, take uh, over the country, uh, Canada and the United States from within. How do you feel about that? Oh, that's absolutely true. There was a uh, Soviet defector named Golinsky. You may know his book. And Golinsky uh, outlined all this in detail about uh, 15 or 20 years ago. And Golinsky's book is hard to find. But uh, it's all in there. Isn't so, excuse me. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, isn't Galinsky uh, the the, the uh, refected general who said that Clinton was in uh, Moscow for three years in, during his youth and was being trained by the KGB? Oh yes, uh, Clinton had advanced training in Moscow. Was that Galinsky's book? Uh, I'm not sure if it's Galinsky or not, but there are other sources on that. There's no question about right. it. Clinton. Well, now some people claim that Clinton was actually a CIA operative, which is possible too. You know. Because you know yourself, uh, you have double agents, triple agents, quadruple <laughs> agents. <laughs> and so uh, we all have this uh, idea that a person can only work for one group at a time. In fact, a guy who has ability 
uh, everybody wants him, and they don't care if he's a double or triple agent. They want him on their side. So uh, a lot of these people work for four or five different outfits. Okay, thank you very much. Surely. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, I've studied uh, John Nelson's work. Are you familiar with John? John Nelson? Nelson, John Nelson. In Colorado? Uh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm, yeah. I'm, I've been corresponding. One, one of the uh, uh, things that he really hammered home and, uh, in some of his information is that you cannot contract with yourself in all notes, legal tender, have two signatures on it representing the government, of which if you can't contract with yourself, one of them's not of local, local uh, properties. Therefore, all dollars are really international obligations. And when going into court, therefore, in a tax issue, you should be pleading international law because what they're collecting from you is an international obligation. Would you concur with that theory? Well, uh, obligations are contractual, and they're covered by the law. And uh, the only thing you can do to protect yourself is uphold your contractual obligations and hope that the other side upholds them. <laughs> and this is where legal ability comes in, because if they don't uphold their contractual obligations, then you have the ability to sue them. But uh, there again, it's an it's a adversary situation. And uh, what it comes down to is your in individual responsibility to defend your own interests. And you cannot defend your own interests by going out and hiring a lawyer or by going into a court and expecting justice, because any judge in the, in the States and probably Canada also, as Ernest Zundel can tell you, uh, <laughs> you go into a court looking for justice, the judges laugh their heads off. <laughs> they know it doesn't exist. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'd just like to know what you feel about that Columbine massacre that happened there a few couple of years ago. In the school. In the, oh, I got that in Columbine. In the schools there. Well, Pardon? the whole Columbine, uh, episode was part of Clinton's gun control operation. And the two alleged uh, students who did this, we don't know whether they did or not. We don't know if they were fired a shot, as a matter of fact. But uh, they were on uh, very strong medication. And uh, with that kind of medication, you get hallucinations, delusions. And you also come under mind control. I'm sure Kathy could tell you a lot about that. So if they did what they did, they did it because they were under mind control, because teenagers normally do not shoot their fellow students, nor do they commit suicide. But you see, under mind control, once you have carried out the operation, then you are instructed to, to commit suicide. So that uh, it must have been a standard mind control operation. Um, I used to say to monopolize it questions, but I'm going to give you one more question. Surely. Um, and an observation. Um, I noticed uh, in these school shootings and church shootings, I've contended all along it was CIA mind control in most instances. Oh, yes. In order to uh, pass the uh, legislation that would do away with the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. Um, I noticed the newspaper articles the first day or maybe a day and a half after the shootings where they go in and search the homes of the shooters in uh, about half of them, the newspapers reported they found satanic drawings in the homes. Oh, yeah. So, and I, I've been involved in, you know, investigating Satanism for a number of years, and I contend that, uh, that this, these shootings are not only CI mind control, but dovetails into the satanic movement itself. you have any, any thoughts on that? Oh, definitely. In fact, many adolescents are taken by these uh, games like Guns and Dragons and all this sort of stuff. So there's a lot of that. Uh, it, it appeals to the adolescent mind, this sort of stuff, because it's costumes and rituals and excitement and different from the mundane world that they live in. So uh, they're very susceptible to this, and once they get into it, uh, then they're drawn into rituals and drugs and so forth, and uh, some of them are already on drugs anyway. So uh, they're simply being manipulated because adolescents are very easy to manipulate because they're inexperienced and... Uh, they're responsive to adults, and so uh, they're easy to control. Okay, last one. No problem. Okay. What's your view on the uh, Masonic movement? Well, I've written about that extensively in my uh, book, The Curse of Canaan, and I trace it back uh, 5,000 years to the original Babylon and uh, to uh, Nimrod. Nimrod was the first Masonic ruler of the uh, United of the world, and he ruled by total evil. And of course, they had uh, their satanic rituals and they had human sacrifice, you name it, they had it. And uh, that's been more continuous throughout history. As I point out in the Curse of Canaan, 
they periodically have to go underground because their crimes are exposed. And so they go underground and disappear and reappear uh, as something else a couple of hundred years later. Uh, you have to have a uh, long time frame in order to study these things because, as I say, these movements may totally disappear for 300 years and then they appear in another country in a total different uh, guise. So you just have to watch for the telltale signs, what they do and what kind of people are doing it. And so it's a matter of observation and experience. You have to know what to look for. It's like any investigative work. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, <laughs> it's not going to come up and hit you in the head. You've got to go find it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we do have to wrap up. Uh, tape time, I think, is probably coming to an end, and uh, we have to get on to the rest of the speakers. So, Eustace Walls, thank you very, very much for your